What is up, you guys? Welcome back to my channel. I am fresh here from CrimeCon, and as much as I want to sit here and rave about the amazing experience that I had, I'm going to save that to the very end of the video. I met so many of you guys, got a whole lot of recommendations that I wasn't really expecting to get, and it's kind of caused me to pull a few things out of my sleeves, and I may be starting something new and very interesting that a lot of you guys might be interested in, so definitely stay tuned to the end of the video to hear that. But today, first things first, is this case we are speaking about. So we're going to be speaking about the unsolved murder of LaDonna Cooper back in 1987 in Marion, Illinois. Her murder was obviously devastating for her family and for the entire community. And knowing that whoever was responsible for what happened to LaDonna Cooper is still out there to this day that we know of, at least, uh, it still has everyone looking over their shoulder in this community and a family scared and confused and looking for justice. I'm posting this video the time that I am because I was made aware that the Southern Illinoisan is in the middle of actually a lawsuit, a pretty serious one, against Williamson County Sheriff's Office, the Illinois State Police, Williamson County Coroner's Office, and just the city of Marion because they are attempting to get files in this case. They're actually claiming that the information in regards to this case, like all of the case files and those things, are being withheld despite their request under a FOIA or FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, whatever you may call it. And unfortunately, that is something that is kind of common. I want to say I probably don't receive 50% of the FOIAs that I request. Um, usually it's because there is an open criminal investigation. There are, I feel like a lot of people assume that when you request those, when you send in and ask for those police files, that you will automatically be given it because uh, it's freedom of information and we should have access to those things. But when it's protecting the integrity of the investigation, obviously they can't just hand it over. However, in this particular case, as I said, this happened in 1987. We are well over 30 years since this murder occurred. And at this point, putting this case out there for people to hear um, may ring some bells. It could bring forward critical information that could help piece together what exactly happened. One of LaDonna's daughters is also trying to work with the Southern Illinoisan to get her mother's story out there. She has a lot of respect for the way that they report the cases that they cover, and even she has had very little access to information in her mother's case. So far, they have managed to get some of the case files, but from what I've seen, it was not all of them. I want to say at the very end of March, I think it was, possibly the end of April. I can't remember which it was. They did have another court date where they were attempting to get the rest of them. They really want to be able to cover it in their series, Chasing Closure, so that hopefully there can be some some sort of justice and eyes back onto this senseless murder. But before I get into the rest of the details of this case, I do need to first say a huge thank you to Audible for partnering with me on today's video. You guys, Audible always supports my channel. They have for years. It's allowed me to create this content for you guys and for these families and then support the families in return as much as I possibly can. Audible is the leading provider for spoken word entertainment and one of my absolute favorite ways to consume content. There are dozens of genres ranging from everything, and you guessed it, true crime to history, fiction, self-help. They even have guided meditation and guided fitness as well as sleep tracks. So if you want to do a little bit of soul searching or you want to educate yourself on an important topic, work towards a new goal, or maybe even just unwind, which is usually what I use it for, there is something for you. You can conveniently download or stream all of the different selections anytime, anywhere. So it's great if you're on the go or if you're just hanging out around the house and want to listen while you're getting your chores done. Plus, members get even more now with their all-new Plus catalog. The whole entire selection of audiobooks, originals, podcasts, and more that are included in your membership. And as if that's not enough, members get to choose one title monthly from their entire catalog, which includes the new releases and the best sellers and I particularly took advantage of that on my way to CrimeCon. I cannot stand flights. I get very, very nervous. So I went ahead and started listening to Unmasked, My Life Solving America's Cold Cases by none other than Paul Holes. Now I'm not all the way done yet. I'm only a few chapters in. I have been waiting for this audiobook to come out for what feels like forever now. And I was not at all disappointed, you guys. Man, he gets incredibly vulnerable in this. I was not sure what to expect, but it just absolutely blew me away. You get a complete look into how Paul Holes got into the field, um, you know, the impact that it had on his family life and how he raised his children and just his whole experience looking into all of these cases. I have met him in person at 
to crime cons now, and he is very quiet, very reserved. So to hear this side of him that you just don't normally get to hear, it definitely was unexpected and very appreciated. So if you're interested in listening to Unmasked, or if you want to just explore what Audible has to offer, go to audible.com forward slash Danielle or text Danielle to 500, 500 to get one free audiobook, a 30 day free trial, and of course, access to the plus catalog. Huge thank you again to Audible. And now on to the details of this case. LaDonna Cooper was born on June 26, 1954 in Marion, Illinois. So she lived there for the entirety of her life. Marion seems to be just this cute little town. It's on the very Southern end of Illinois with a population, at least at the time of just over 10,000 people. Eventually, in this little town LaDonna lived in, she fell head over heels for a man named Bobby Cooper. So they went on to get married and had three children of their own, Kelly, Jody, and Ryan. And all three of their children were under the age of 13 when their mother was horrifically and senselessly taken from them. There's really not much out there available about who LaDonna was as a person during her short time here on earth. But the few things that I have read do give you a glimpse into how important she was to everyone surrounding her. LaDonna was described by those that knew her as an incredible mom. She was 31 at the time and her children and husband were her absolute world. Everything revolved around them. Prior to death, she worked as an assistant manager at a restaurant known as Bonanza Steakhouse. It is now a tequila's Mexican restaurant restaurant right off of Interstate 57 in Marion, and this made her a well-known face in the community. All the regulars knew LaDonna. It was a popular restaurant, and they looked forward to seeing her smiling face when they would come in for a bite to eat. On the night of Wednesday, March 4th, 1987, LaDonna was working the nighttime shift, so the dinner shift, at Bonanza Steakhouse, and Bobby decided to bring all three of their children in to have dinner with her. She did have a dinner break that night, and so they wanted to make sure they could still have dinner as a family. Um, and they had absolutely no idea that this was in fact going to be the very last time they would see their mother. So as unfortunate and tragic as all of the circumstances are in this case, there is this piece of me that's so incredibly happy that they got to have that last experience with each other. After a good time visiting together, Bobby decided to take the three of their children back home to settle them in for the night and wait on LaDonna to finish up her dinner rush and close the restaurant. The restaurant happened to be unusually busy that night, so the employees did stay later than usual, including LaDonna. So at around 11.45 p.m. that night, LaDonna called Bobby from the restaurant phone, saying that she was finishing up, she'd already done all of her closing duties, she was putting the bank deposit together, and that after stopping at the bank on her way home, she would be home, and this should have taken about 10 minutes tops. As assistant manager, LaDonna was always the last person in the restaurant unless the other manager was there. Her job was to make sure all of the money was set and ready to go for the next morning when they opened up. She also had to organize all of the receipts from that day. And as I mentioned, she had to put together the bank drop that she would usually drop off on her way home. And of course, lock everything up, close everything up for the night. Bobby sat in the family living room, patiently waiting for his wife to arrive home, and he ended up drifting off to sleep while he was waiting. Bobby woke up about 30 minutes after this phone call from LaDonna, and he was fully expecting her to be home already and was kind of shocked that he, she hadn't woken him up. But when he looked around, he realized that LaDonna was nowhere to be found. At first, he didn't panic. He likely assumed that she was finishing things up. Maybe she forgot one of her closing tasks, something along those lines. Something was just taking long longer. So he decided to call into Bonanza's, assuming she would answer and be like, oh yeah, sorry, just had to get a few things done. I'm on my way home now. But when he called Bonanza's, there was no answer. At this point, Bobby decided to head into the restaurant. I'm sure it's a very scary feeling at this point, not knowing where your wife is, not being able to get in touch with her. She's out there by herself late at night with a large amount of money. So he decided to head to the restaurant and he was also keeping an eye out for her light blue 1986 Buick Century that she would have been driving because his other theory was, you know, she's on the road somewhere. She ran into car trouble, you know, maybe she needs help, a flat tire, something. But his whole entire drive, he never sees LaDonna or the car. And then upon arriving to Bonanza's, Bobby also notices that her car is not there either. The lot was completely empty which maybe she was driving home and they just missed each other. But when he noticed that the front door to the restaurant was wide open, this is when he knew that something was absolutely wrong. Now, I've seen a handful of different accounts of the things that kind of happened over the this next few minutes. That's something that's very typical with these older cases. 
I'm sure a lot of the information that was in articles online is no longer available. From what I have seen, ultimately, at some point, the manager was called and did come to check things out. And also, obviously, the police were called to report her as missing. From what I've seen, the manager did confirm that most of the closing duties were done. It appeared as if she was, in fact, finished up for the night, just like she stated on the phone, and was about to head out. But the bank drop was nowhere to be found. That big bag of money, uh, the money that was supposed to be there to open the following morning, was also not there. And all of the receipts from that day were gone. So pretty obvious there was some sort of robbery that happened here. The Williamson County Sheriff's Department arrived on scene as well, and they immediately noticed there are clear signs of a struggle, not just in the restaurant, but outside of the restaurant as well. Things were a total disarray in the restaurant. Um, there were small traces of blood that were found, I believe, in the restaurant, and then also out by where LaDonna's car was parked. So something did happen here. LaDonna didn't have any known enemies, as I said. She was just this quiet, sweet mother taking care of her family, working in pretty much all of her free time. There really wasn't anyone that would have been out to harm her for any reason at all. So it became clear that she likely was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. The community at this point was shocked and horrified, and they were all doing everything they possibly could to locate LaDonna, and five local police departments also joined in on the search and investigative efforts to try to bring her home as fast as possible. Searches began looking all over for LaDonna's light blue Buick, all over Marion, all over the neighboring cities. Photos of her car, as well as just a photo of herself, were all over town in hopes that if someone saw something, they would come forward. During the search around Bonanza, they were trying to look for any evidence of LaDonna, maybe other locations of a struggle, um, and they ended up checking the different dumpsters that were around this little stretch of different restaurants and businesses, and they went to check behind a business known as the Hitching Post. It was a Western store. I'm not sure if it is there anymore, and they checked the dumpster right out back and ended up finding LaDonna's purse and her wallet. But other than that, there were no other signs of LaDonna, but this just added to the urgency of needing to find her as soon as possible. And by 6 p.m. that day, police ended up getting a call from a concerned citizen. This individual said that they had seen the information on LaDonna's car, and they believed that her car was parked in their residential neighborhood and had been there since early that Thursday morning. Sure enough, when police arrived to the intersection of South 6th Street and Stotler Street, they found LaDonna's car abandoned. This intersection in particular is about 10 minutes away from the restaurant. The car itself had a lot of mud caked in the wheel wells, which is never a good sign because usually that means that that car for some reason went off of the road, um, which usually does not lead to a good ending. They didn't find anything else inside of the car, at least that has been released by police, but there was, however, blood on the inside of the car and on the outside, and the blood found so far between the car and the restaurant was not enough to indicate a fatal wound, which was very, very hopeful, but at the very least, it made authorities believe that LaDonna fought off her attacker. Whoever had come to get her, she fought with everything she had. Now, I have seen one article. I don't know, have any way of confirming this. I don't know how accurate this is, so just keep that in mind, um, that the blood in the car on the inside and outside was on the driver's side. And it has caused a lot of conversations looking into you know, if possible, you know, she was obviously injured if she was the one that was driving her car. Um, however, I see almost the exact opposite from that. If you think about it, police believed at this point that LaDonna had been fighting off her attacker, which means it's very likely she harmed them as well. If she was going at her attacker that hard, I don't find it very likely that at that point they would ever put her behind a driver's seat of a car because she likely would have plans of her own. So in my opinion, I think that it was the attacker that was driving the vehicle, and it's very possible that the blood found on the vehicle is actually from whoever that person was. Again, that's just my speculation, and that's also based on something I cannot confirm, but I did want to add it just in case, because to me, that shows a lot of hope that DNA testing could be a possibility. Other than finding the car, there was absolutely no sign of Donna. Her keys weren't there, um, you know, nothing else at all. So they took the car off for forensic testing. 1.30 p.m. on March 6, police received another phone call from an employee from the Crab Orchard Wildlife Refuge, which is about 20 minutes away from the restaurant, about 10 minutes away from the car. It's a very interesting location. So 
when I was visualizing this without seeing a map, I pictured, you know, like the restaurant and then drive one way and you hit this refuge and then drive, you know, straight again and it's the car, but things are kind of jumbled up, which I'll get into in just a minute. So this employee had been doing their rounds at the wildlife refuge and they were at the observation tower, which runs right along highway 148. And they noticed kind of in the refuge off of that highway, there were tire tracks in the mud. And we already know that there was mud in the wheel wells of her car. So when they kind of follow these tire tracks, they notice that further up by the wetlands area, it's like a little pond marshy area, there was something right at the edge of the water. And when they looked through binoculars, they realized it was a body. When police arrived, they were in fact able to confirm that it was the body of LaDonna Cooper. She had been stabbed multiple times. Um, she had multiple defensive wounds, just adding to the fact they already knew that she fought with everything she had against her attacker. LaDonna had been senselessly stripped away from her family for like a couple thousand dollars. There wasn't even that much there. And someone had gone through all of this length of taking her from the restaurant, dumping her body miles away, and then again, dumping her car. And no one has any idea why or who did it to this day. The investigation continued in attempts to figure out who was behind this awful attack, but obviously forensics were way different back then. DNA testing, it was a thing in the 80s. I believe 84 was when it started, but at that point, it wasn't readily available. It wasn't like everyone was doing DNA testing. Even here we are 30 years later, it's common, but it's still not something that's done all of the time because it's expensive, it takes time. Um, so it wasn't necessarily something they could utilize at the time of this crime. They did make managed to collect over 150 different pieces of evidence, but they still just didn't seem any closer to answers. It was a call on March 8th into authorities. So a few days after LaDonna's body was found and this kind of helped the timeline just a little bit. Um, and in my opinion, makes me feel a very certain way. Um, but someone called in reporting to have seen LaDonna's light blue car early morning hours of the 5th, so just after she was thought to be abducted or kidnapped from the restaurant um, at 12.45 a.m. And they claim to have seen the car at the intersection of Samuel Road and Old 13, which is just up the road. It's like one turn away from this refuge, but it's also like this back country road. And I feel like it's a really random road to go down. Um, and when police went to this location, they did manage to find receipts from Bonanza's restaurant at the Petrolane Gas Company right beside this intersection. I can't find any information really on the Petrolane gas station. So there is like something there at the intersection on that corner. It's obviously not a gas station at this point. Um, and I don't know if Petrolane Gas Company was even a gas station. I don't know if it was just like a distributor or, you know, something along those lines. I don't know if it's possible someone stopped in to get gas real quick or just to throw some things away like these receipts. But either way, it did show that at some point that night, the attacker and possibly LaDonna was at this location. Now, the timeline that we have at this point means that LaDonna was likely attacked almost immediately, probably after speaking to Bobby on the phone. It's my personal opinion that this was not the act of just one individual, because if they took LaDonna's car, either A, that means that was their only form of transportation at the time, um, or B, there was a second person there and they just wanted to get rid of her car so it took longer for anyone to find her or even know that she was potentially a missing person and then a homicide victim. And then again, when her car was abandoned on that random street in the residential neighborhood, this attacker either walked off on foot, which is a very risky thing to do, but there's a huge chance there was some sighting maybe, or there was another person involved, as I said before, with some sort of getaway car. So I think it's possible we're looking at more than one person being involved in this crime. And I haven't really seen that mentioned anywhere so I just kind of wanted to point that out. But other than that, we really don't know the order in which these different locations kind of were gone to. It's all over the place, as I said. I promise I'm like harping on this for a particular reason. So obviously this started at the restaurant and there's not really a super straight shot to this random intersection that the receipts were found. So I don't know if they like overshot it and then looped, receipts were dumped, and then they went back on to 148 
and then stopped at the refuge or if they went straight from the restaurant to the refuge and then this attacker then went to throw the last remaining things off at this random intersection off of 148, then got back on 148 and headed straight up to um, you know, the place where the car was found. It's a 15 minute drive from the restaurant to the refuge. And then from the refuge to that intersection is like seven to 10 minutes. And then from that intersection to where a car was found, it was about another 10 minute drive. But why this is so interesting to me and like the route that's possibly taken and the number of routes is that this was not the age of Google Maps being on your phone, you know? So by looking at these random routes taken, I genuinely feel like this person knew exactly where they were going. This was someone that was possibly very familiar with the area. And this is believed by many in the community that based on the location they took LaDonna to, to dump her body, this isn't something that someone would know to go to if they were just passing through or anything along those lines. There's even this small dirt road that cuts off of 148, which is likely where those tire marks were seen. And it takes you around the wetlands where her body was ultimately thrown out of the vehicle. And then it loops like all the way back down and around and throws you out on Ogden Road and that's right beside 148. And that's like a random road. And to me, it looks like an access road. It's not like a road people regularly use. So I feel like someone would have had to have known, you know, this is exactly where I'm going to take her because there's an access road. It takes me out of the sight of anyone on 148. Um, it's just, to me, it seems super deliberate. And on top of that, I think where her car was put was also very deliberate and planned out. So most of the roads up in Heron, which is the neighboring town that her car was found in, it's a grid system. It's very easy to navigate. Every square, every block is, you know, connected. However, I find it very interesting that the one road that her car was found on was kind of separated from the rest of the grid system. There's the main road coming up, 148. Most of the other streets you can cut right through, but the one street her car was off of, you couldn't access easily from the main road. You had you would have to specifically be going to that location because the high school kind of chops the grid off. Some have also theorized that it's possible LaDonna may have known her attacker. I personally am not sure why this is theorized. I've not seen it stated anywhere, um, but I also don't know LaDonna and I don't know this community the way that a lot of these people do. So if they believe it's possible, there must be something Something out there that makes him believe that. And while all of these questions just swirled unanswered, her family was trying to come to grasp with their new reality. Bobby was thrown into the depths of grief while also having to navigate how to be a single father at this point to three children who were going through unimaginable grief of their own. Her keys were also never located and one of LaDonna's daughters, because of this, her house key was there. She slept with a knife under her pillow for an extended period of time after her mother's death because she was so scared that whoever attacked her mother still had the house key and would come back to their home and hurt them. I cannot imagine living and that kind of fear. This conversation came up at CrimeCon time after time after time about these families and what they go through. The families are just as much a victim as the actual person that was attacked themselves as they are going through something that so many of us will never have to experience. And they're trying to figure out how to work with police departments. They're trying to figure out how to keep up the best communication. They're, they're trying to figure out a completely foreign world that no one hopes to ever have to experience all while trying to figure out how to manage their own loss and some of the things that they have to learn about the loss of their loved one. Bobby was so distraught that he struggled with just day-to-day -day activities, let alone figuring out how to figure out this homicide investigation. So many questions weren't asked, just because he simply could not bear to ask them. And as years passed, it seems they were getting no closer to answers. In 2005, police did come forward and announced that they were genuinely hoping that DNA technology would help them solve the case. There had been so many advancements at this point, and this to me, again, just suggests that, that one of those 150 pieces of evidence does include DNA. Again, that possible blood in the car. I know that she defended herself a lot. So I'm clinging to that hope if you can't tell for dear life. However, you have to have someone to compare the DNA to, and that leads us to suspects in this case. It was also announced by Jeff McCoskey from the cold case unit in 2005 that quote, we've looked pretty hard at about 20 people. Some have been eliminated completely. 
Some have been eliminated a little bit and some have not been eliminated at all. So we know there were at least 20 individuals that for some reason police believed were suspects, not just person of interest, but people that could potentially have been involved in this. And again, because there's just not much evidence that was left behind, not much information out there, the police are holding a lot of things very close to the vest to protect the integrity of the investigation. So we don't know exactly how many out of the 20 were weeded out, but from even the most recent interviews, it seems that some of those are still left behind. Paul Eccles from Carbondale Police Department was also brought in to get a fresh set of eyes on the evidence collected, and this ended up leading to resubmitting 30 pieces of that evidence, but I am still unsure if anything ever came of that. Still years passed and no arrest was made. So I believe it was about 2010 when a cold case squad was created to very specifically look into cold cases in that area. It consists of 10 different retired detectives that are pretty much dedicating their free time to looking into these cases, which is absolutely amazing. That is, in my opinion, what is necessary. In every single police department, you have police officers that are getting new cases weekly, if not daily, and they're trying to keep up with those current ones, but also have the weight of the cold cases that they're trying to look into. So having these different volunteers willing to sit down and look at these cases with, you know, all of the knowledge that they have and all of their free time, I will always support that. So they were looking into LaDonna's case. And in 2012, Bill Marks from this cold case squad came forward confirming, quote, we have suspects. We can see the end of the tunnel. It's just going to be a while before we get there. Despite all these years passing, it does seem that there is always someone that is looking into her case. It just seems like they're waiting for that little bit more, you know, that one piece of information, something to come in, a tip to lead them to the rest that they need to be able to hopefully make an arrest. And it is still encouraged, obviously, to this day that anyone with information on this case, no matter how small it seems, pass that over and let the people with the rest of the puzzle figure out if it fits or not. There is a part of me that believes there is something premeditated about this. Honestly, the first thing that took me off guard was the fact that it's believed to have been like a burglary, a kidnapping because of a burglary, but you don't see that all too often. And most burglaries gone wrong. You know, if someone was just running in there to take the money and go, or, you know, something along those lines, usually those individuals don't go to the effort to then conceal a body, dump a car. So I feel like there is a huge chance there that there may be more to this case. There may be something else going on here. And obviously someone, if not multiple people are involved. And I believe that that means there's a lot more than just one person that has answers as to what exactly happened to LaDonna Cooper and who is responsible. Genealogy is like my largest hope with this case, seeing how things with DNA have advanced and you know, all of the good things that are happening in a lot of these cold cases and all these cases from like decades ago. Um, and genealogy just continues to progress. And if police have DNA and for some reason don't have anyone to test it against, I feel like using genealogy could at least narrow down the pool a little bit, which really links into my suggestion on Paul Hull's book because he helped um, play a part in catching the Golden State Killer and genealogy was involved. It's like a full circle moment here, but I genuinely believe believe so many cold cases can be solved using genealogy. And I have hope that that may be the answer for this case. LaDonna's parents have since unfortunately passed away without knowing why their daughter was taken from them without seeing someone put away for it. So I'm really hoping that more coverage on this and then more specifically the information that's hopefully released through the Southern Illinoisan will bring peace and answers to the Cooper family. Her daughter, Judy said, quote, I hold on to the memories that I do have and remember how loved she made me feel. And I try to pass the love and warmth on to my own children. She may not be here physically, but she's never left us. She lives on through me, my siblings, and all of her grandchildren. I feel she continues to guide us from above. There is a $1,000 award being offered by Crime Stoppers to anyone that can bring forward information that leads to an arrest in this case. People talk, you guys, especially after all of this time. And usually at this point, well, at least hopefully, and again, this just may be like my bleeding heart, 
<laughs> hoping to see the best in people, but especially after this much time has passed, it really makes me hope that someone's grown a conscience and will come forward and be like, look, I participated in this, or I, you know, heard this and have kept it a secret all this time, but I have to get this off my chest. I will make sure to keep an eye out on the coverage from the Southern Illinoisan so that you guys can see more information that I may not have had access to here on this video, all of those interviews from the people that know LaDonna the best. And as always, I hope for nothing more than answers and healing for her family. That is all that I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to LaDonna's story. And before I go, I do want to speak about CrimeCon, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video. First and foremost, please, please, you guys, go and follow CrimeCon on all different forms of social media so you have the opportunity to see when the next one's going to be and the different events that they have because it is such a learning experience. I think it's something that everyone involved in true crime needs to go through at least one time. This year was absolutely incredible. I believe the next one will be in, at least in the United States, the next one will be in September in Florida. I believe Orlando specifically. There is a Crime Con UK. I don't think I'm going to that one, but I know I'll be at the one in Florida. They've got like cruises and all sorts of things that they do over there. But this year was absolutely awesome. As you guys know, I try my hardest to bring ethics into true crime and you know, I learn along the way I'm not perfect by any means at all. I know there's plenty of videos where I now have totally differing opinions and things that I wish that I hadn't said. And I've since creating my channel been able to speak to so many different families and learn so many things. And I'm honestly thankful to have all of those opportunities. So when John and I, John Lorden, were able to sit at our booth all weekend and we realized that the main conversation being had with people that came as viewers of both of our channels or our podcast, or it was just people coming to check us out. They hadn't heard of us before. The main conversation was about bringing ethics into true crime and doing the best we can to remember that these are real people. It was honestly absolutely amazing. And I was already on this absolute high from going to the Sister Strong session where I got to hear Sarah Turney talk. Um, Mar Murray's sister was there. Kelsey German was there. And hearing what they've gone through and the different things they've experienced through the media and the coverage that's been out there for their families. And it was just a lot. It was a huge learning experience. And looking back at all of the different people in that session that were hearing about how to consume true crime as ethically as possible, um, you know, how to help the families the best you can, all of these things, seeing how many people were there hearing it, I was just absolutely freaking overjoyed. In my opinion, CrimeCon is what you make it. And obviously there's always gonna be people that are there for the sensationalized version of things and, you know, for reasons that not all of us necessarily agree with. But I feel like there is an opportunity there to learn and to hear from different people and families what they're experiencing. I had an amazing time and I also got to have a little meet and greet with a few of you guys. You know if that was you. We had such a good time. I left there absolutely thrilled and it gave me an opportunity to sit down and be like, look, my channel, you know, what would you like to see? You know, what would you like me to do? How can I better your experience? And I had an amazing suggestion and it wasn't just the only suggestion that weekend. It's like she spread the word after I spoke to her because I had a lot of different people mention it and it was to offer my YouTube videos as a podcast. So I'm trying to work out the logistics of that right now. I've dabbled my feet in that before and then got really nervous because I don't ever want to lose anything in translation going from video form to just audio form. I also weigh over think absolutely everything, which they made me very well aware of when we were when we were talking. Um, but I'm trying to get that in motion. I feel like there's an entirely different, you know, audience that I could be missing out on by not having my videos on audio form, people that I, you know, otherwise wouldn't reach. And most of the people down in my comments, most of you guys anyways, are always like, oh, I'm gonna put this on while I'm doing dishes. So that currently is in the works. I'm not gonna promise any time frame because I have a specific way that I want to do it. I'll be putting all of my older videos, I believe, as podcast form, but instead of just taking the audio off of them and throwing them in a podcast, because I just said I've learned so much over the last couple of years, I think I'm going to revisit all of my old videos, 
all of the old cases that I've looked into, see if my opinions have changed, call myself out on the things that I was wrong about and have learned since then. Um, hopefully do updates on those cases as well. So it will also be a new experience. And also I'll be throwing in my newer um, videos and podcast form as well. So you won't be missing anything. It won't just be all old information, um, but we'll see. I'm very excited for it. I honestly cannot thank you guys enough and everyone who came up to me and encouraged me to do all these different things while I met you at CrimeCon because I can be a very nervous person if you can't tell. <laughs> I have really high anxiety and I always just, once I get comfortable with something, I get so worried about changing it. So having those conversations and hearing that feedback from you guys, it, it really helps to push me forward in a positive direction. On that note, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and go thank you so much again for taking the time out of your day to listen to LaDonna's story and to also hear me rant about Crime Con. I highly suggest you guys check out the next one. Getting to meet you is like a highlight, being able to put a face to who I'm talking to and just hearing everything you have to say and all your feedback means the absolute world to me. I would sit at that table at Podcast Row for an eternity if it meant I got to meet every single one of you guys and just thank you for being here on this journey with me over the past couple of years. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.